Hey guys, in this week's Casually Criterion episode, we are reviewing La Dolce Vita. And that's it. That's all we're doing. So join us. Welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris, and with me as always is Mike. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. Uh, this is what you had to think about? Yeah. Are you enjoying the sweet life? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> also enjoying the sweet life, I hope. Uh, Justin, how are you doing today? I am good. Life is sweet. That sounds like I'm going to do a poem. Yeah. But I can't think of anything to rhyme with sweet. <laughs> it was kind of off beat. There you go. This is oh, this is what you well, had to think about. Yeah. yeah, I was I was like, in case Justin says sweet and needs something to rhyme with it, I'm gonna say beat. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well good call. If this is your first time listening, this is a casually criterion episode, which we like to do every other episode, where we review a film from the Criterion Collection. <laughs> that is voted on by our listeners via our Twitter page. Before we get into the main review, we will not be doing anything. That's it. That's all, that's all we're doing is the main review. So, uh, no need to skip around. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And um, did you did you do the Criterion stuff? Or is that... Did you the say that we do The Criterion stuff's mainly on uh, the other episodes. Oh, yeah, okay. I said that... Yeah. All right. Well, if you want to um, follow along and help choose our Criterion re- films that we review on the Casual Criterion episodes, uh, follow us on Twitter at Casual Cinecast. That's the best place to uh, vote in those polls. It's the only place to vote for those polls, actually. Yep. It's the best place That's to follow it. us. Yeah. You can <laughs> send us messages, <laughs> ask us questions about the movies you're reviewing uh, to that Twitter account or to casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And then, of course, if you haven't done so already, you like the show you want to help other people find it give us a rating positive review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on yeah please and thank you okay and since we're not doing the usual news on the march let's just get into the main review starting now uh la dolce vita here we go spine number 733 invece Roma piace moltissimo. Una specie di giungla, tiepida, tranquilla. Marcello! Dove ci si può nascondere bene? What's the thing you like most in life? Love, love and love. La vita più miserabile, l'esistenza protetta da una società organizzata in cui tutto sia previsto, tutto perfetto. Dolce Vita was directed by Federico Fellini. It stars Marcello Mastriani, Anita Ekberg, Anak Ami, and Yvonne Furneaux. I did my best. All right. The IMDb synopsis says, A series of stories following a week in the life of a philandering tabloid journalist living in Rome. All right. So as always with our Criterion films, they are older films. Typically, they've usually been out at least a few years. So we will not be doing the usual spoiler free section that we do uh, up front for our newer films. So this is your spoiler warning right now. If you have not seen the Dolce Vita, um, then you don't want anything spoiled. Go watch the movie now. Come back, finish listening to the podcast 
And um, yeah, if you're going to continue listening, I hope you enjoy uh, our review of this three hour movie that is also going to be three hours long. I think that's the plan. That's why we skipped news on the March, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we got to outdo the movie. So like three and a half hours long. (laughs) Yeah. At least. Yeah. What we got to aim for. An hour each of general impressions. And and with that, (laughs) uh, who chose this film? Gentlemen. I did. That's right. So I did. Three wins in the last four times. Just, just putting it out there. Yeah. Nine hours of a movie watching. <laughs> we we cumulative Mike? like 43 hours of our life or did uh, we lose me? just with the movies I've picked. <laughs> All right. So since you chose this film, why don't you uh, start us off and tell us why you chose this film? Yeah, absolutely. Why I chose the film? Because it's Federico Fellini. What was the theme of this this one? I forget. Can winners? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um yeah, so I picked it for the can winners. Um, I, I love Fellini. He's pretty amazing. And I love this film, even though, <laughs> you know, it is long, uh, as you guys continue to remind me. Um, but, man, is there any director that, like, shoots chaos better? Like, uh, there is, like, so many giant set pieces in this in this film, you know, because it's, it's extremely episodic. And um, each... One, like, there's, like, all sorts of stuff going on in the frame. All, you know, like, uh, he he doesn't just necessarily cut it to the close-ups each time. He, uh, there's, you know, there's a scene between uh, um, Marcello or Marcello uh, and his dad. And it's just a really simple scene where they're just talking together. But there are, like, masses of mounts of people walking behind them, you know, like, back and forth, you know. So there's so much going on. And that's just, like, a a little example of stuff that's going on throughout the whole film. Um, I I really like uh, Marcel Mastriani. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, I think he's really great. He is um, up there with, like... Cary Grant <laughs> for like charisma you know like we don't mm-hmm. watch I, I don't watch him as much because he's Italian and I, I've seen plenty of his films mainly the Fellini films that he's in uh, I would like to explore further his uh, uh, body of work but I think he's great in this film he's great in eight and a half but um, he may even be better in this film uh, I, I love how this film uh Roger Ebert, like I read a review that came from Roger Ebert, and he talked about how he's like, oh, I went and saw this film, and people are saying that there's like, you can identify the seven sins in this film, and the seven days as he descends descends into hell, so there's like all these readings you can have uh, about this film, but Roger Ebert just says, that makes it too much of a crossword puzzle, you're trying to fit everything into the right spot, really what this movie is about is just this man who has no center and is trying to find his way in life, uh, and I agree with him. You know, like, it doesn't matter what the... It's fun to uh, add that extra reading to it. But um, ultimately, that that part of it doesn't matter because the characters are intriguing and you are along for the ride. Uh, it, this is an extremely, like, melancholy, sad movie, uh, ultimately, I think, with moments of joy as we go through it. But I, I really like this movie. Um... It's beautiful, uh, and I can't wait to talk more about it. But first, Mike, what did you think? All right, so this is not my first time seeing this movie. I saw this sure. movie many years ago, and I guess let me talk, I guess, briefly about my first experience with it because when I was first over, uh, I was just more relieved than anything i was i I don't think i had gotten it sure yeah you know uh i was like what is the plot of this movie why is it so long and sprawling and and at the time i thought um focusless you know it it just felt very well like you said it's very episodic right so sure it's not the normal structure of a movie and so i i didn't i just didn't quite get it and then you know, uh, I started to think about it more and, and dissecting it more. And, and then you realize it's actually really great. Like all the reasons that I didn't get it the first time are all the reasons it's good. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you just kind of have to be open to it. And for my money, 
I like this one better than eight and a half. Um, I enjoy eight and a half quite a bit. I think it's great. Uh, sure. But I, it's very surreal in places. Um, obviously, and kind of goes in and out of reality and dreams and fantasy. And I kind of like the straightforward nature of the earlier Fellini stuff a little bit more. But then again, I mean, you don't get much better than La Dolce Vita, so I understand wanting to experiment after that, you know? Sure. <laughs> um, so anyways, yeah, I, I didn't quite get it the first time. Since then, I've thought about it quite a bit. I like it. Um, the final scene, I think, is is just, like, brilliant. It's so on the nose, yet like vague and artistic at the same time. It, I don't know. I I really enjoy it. Um, nothing else quite feels like this movie. Uh, like you said, you can always kind of spot a Fellini film because there's like a million extras running around and like everyone's a character. Like everyone inhabiting the frame is just like a larger than life character. That also, they feel grounded at the same time though. It never ventures into... Uh, like caricatures or, or something like that, you know? All of them feel very personal. Uh, and anyways, yeah, so I was excited to watch this movie again. I still think it's great. Uh, I didn't feel the three hours as much this time as I did the first time I was watching it and, and not appreciating it for what it was. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think it's really great. Yeah, real quick before we pass it off to Justin, I, I do want to say something. So, I, like you, when I first watched it, I didn't get it, <laughs> you know, or like, but uh, while I walked away, I walked away with like indelible images, you know, like him writing the yeah. girl at the very end, like uh, <laughs> the actress in the um, the fountain. So, like, even though I didn't quite get it, there were things in this movie that kind of just stick with you, even though, you know, like, it's episodic and, yeah. you know, like, f Jesus flying in at the very yeah, beginning. Yeah, like, the on beginning the, the is helicopter. like that for me with the statue. Yeah, you're like, what's helicopter? going on? Yeah. And so there are, even if you don't, I and I'm admitting, you know, like, I didn't get it at first either, you know, like, I actually got to see this in the theater the first time, but I didn't, ooh, you know, like, <laughs> uh, yeah, ooh, look at me. But, um... <laughs> Uh, I can't. Well, yeah. This is a anyways, podcast. I, I, I would say, oh yeah, that's true. Listen to me. Um, anyways, uh, even if you're not understanding it, there are things you walk away with. Um, strong images and things, strong things that you walk away with. Anyways, Justin, uh, what did you think? Yeah, I mean, I've certainly fallen to the camp that you guys are in of the first time you watched the movie, you just kind of didn't get it or didn't quite click uh, so that's that's my experience in fact i think the first hour of this movie i have seen i would bet eight times maybe <laughs> yeah <Agreed>. but yeah <laughs> in its totality this is probably i think my third time to see the movie <laughs> um because it took me many many tries to get through it the first time um and yeah, so like I sat down and I'd made it make it about like an hour through, you know, and then um, I don't know, it would just be not feeling it. It would lose me. And, you know, something we talk about a lot when we go back to these Criterion films, because there's a lot of them that we've seen before and we're revisiting, you know, quite often. It's been 10, 12, 15 years since we last watched the movie. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of times where we realize that, like it we understand a lot more of what's being said um, now and what the themes are now because we're older. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Um, this may be like the greatest example of that for me. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot this time that I was, I was catching to, I was like, man, I'm thinking yeah. about this on a whole new level <laughs> that I didn't <laughs> understand earlier. <laughs> yeah. It's so, like, I was just, I, I honestly, I was like, did I even pay attention to this movie the yeah. first time did I, I watched get it at all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I just don't think I did. I think I was just swinging and missing on any thoughts I've ever had about this movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, my my opinion of it has gone up so much with this watch um, because it's always been uh, my least favorite Fellini movie, and I've seen most oh, wow. of his his bigger stuff. And it was that's insane. Yeah, <laughs> is it? 
I don't know. Not I really. Mean, I don't maybe. know. Maybe. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. I'm, re- <laughs> I'm redacting that opinion now, though. Yeah. Well, that's, <laughs> so, good. that's why it's no <laughs> longer insane. That's why I yeah. came, you came to your senses. It, it was insane. Past tense. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, like, it, it, and maybe it was because I, it came with such a reputation, you know? Like, I first came across it in Roger Ebert's Great Movies book. Yeah. Sure. And that's what led me to watch it. I think I actually rented it from the Netflix like uh, DVD mailing program. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kept that DVD, I think, for like three months trying to get through it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, it had such a reputation that I think I just didn't get it. I was like, OK, I'm, I'm not yeah. I'm not seeing not why seeing this the is the great yeah. one. Yeah. It, and the other ones I connected with better. I liked some of the more surreal fantasy aspects of Eight and a Half or Juliet of the Spirits or Amarcord. Um, maybe those are just more immediately entertaining, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, this it has rocketed up there in the uh, like my Fellini ranking <laughs> with this viewing. I think it looks great, Chris. You're you're spot on with talking about just the things going on in the frames, you know, um, this eight, and eight and a half particularly, uh, excel at that sort of like chaos. And it's something that, um, I couldn't help but think about La Dolce Vita when I watched, uh, Quaron's Roma for like anybody who sure. hasn't yeah. seen any of these, yeah. um, but maybe has seen Roma cause it's newer. Um, like, in some ways, Roma just felt like a Fellini knockoff because it was copying yep. that so well, <laughs> which is not a slight on Roma. But um, yeah, this is this is really great. I feel like before I thought this movie was so disconnected that I, I maybe like I felt like you could watch this movie in hour chunks if you wanted to and it'd right. be fine. But yep. I felt I- so much more connection and like thematic threads going through the movie and. Um, I'm sure this term has been said before. Um, and if it hasn't, I'm, I'm going to coin it right now, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and hopefully my interpretation of this isn't wrong, but, um, I always love a coming of age movie and this one is, is a leaving of age <laughs> movie. All right. Yeah. I, I don't know if that phrase quite makes sense, <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I'm trying it out. Yeah. I'm trying it out. Um, D- explain yourself, sir. Uh, yeah. So, I feel like uh, a lot of this, and I did. I don't know if I quite realized that this movie took place over a week, like the IMDb synopsis says. Yeah, like eight days. Yeah, I don't think I quite realized it was that close together. But I felt we were watching this character lose that part of himself, that um, that youthful part of himself that was like chasing women and being successful at that I, I you know what i mean like realizing like you're older and maybe um and i, well, I guess we can talk about it because we don't have a spoiler section but like <laughs> yeah. i guess i thought about that a lot whenever um he's at that party and he's trying to hit on all the like different girls and at one point like someone takes his That's hand every party <laughs> yeah well like what he it's the one where um the one the girl who's throughout yeah they're in the castle and she's talking to him through that little like weird like echo room where she can sit in the other room and whisper and he hears her mm-hmm. yeah um she ends up with a younger man he tries to talk to some other girl who's just not interested in him um and then his hand ends up getting taken and he ends up in the bedroom and we see who grabs his hand once we're in the bedroom and it's the older woman with like the gray streak in her hair mm-hmm um, which is, I don't know, significantly older <laughs> than the other women we've seen him with, I think. But still attractive. But not, no less attractive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think almost every yeah every person in this movie is attractive in their own uh, way, with, with maybe one exception. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> which I'll, I won't spoil that. I'll let Mike talk about this guy. Mm. But anyways, um, I just felt like, a, like, like there's almost a moment where he wants to flirt with that, it'd be charming with that, the young girl who works at the restaurant cafe thing, mm-hmm. um, which is a Who's little awkward. Young. Yeah. And she's too young, but um, I don't know. Maybe I just almost felt like it took him a second to, there was a second where he wanted to like turn the charm on, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, watching him is like watching so, the entirety of Mad Men, and you're always just like, not that one, Don Draper. Not that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, right. I thought of Mad Men a lot, and I, I didn't, I'm not, I didn't finish it, but I watched like several episodes. <laughs> but I yeah. certainly thought of Mad Men when I watched this. I haven't it, seen all of it. I've seen like three episodes, I think, but yeah. yeah you guys are almost yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've almost finished it. Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> does that make sense what I'm saying? Like leaving of age? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get it for sure. It's it's about getting older. And, well, it's also about, in my opinion, like getting to an age where you kind of, you start to like wonder, like what is the overall shape of my life going to be? Like when I look at it, you know, like where am I going? What, what is happening here? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the father is such a good example of this. And I, I've, the father uh, section really hit me hard this time because you know, like he's he's partying it up. He's got this woman, you know, like uh, and he's gone back to her room, but like he's just too old. He can't keep up anymore, you know, like uh, or he realizes he doesn't really care, you know, like uh, he doesn't want to be out and partying anymore, and he's just mm-hmm. sitting there, you know, when she gets uh marcello and he's just sitting there looking out at the sky you know like he realizes he's no longer young he can, no longer wants to do these things chase after women um i don't mm-hmm. know that 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 really hit me uh, yeah although i've never been necessarily like a womanizer on the at least certainly not on the level that marcello or his dad is <laughs> yeah. um i hope not yeah <laughs> yeah uh, but that that well, makes the whole uh, party sequence at the end where they break into that house it to me it, it kind of reeks of a man desperately trying to prove himself as youthful <laughs> sure right so let me put this out like i, I kind of was googling around and uh was looking at things about this film and you know like uh, even though i said that roger ebert doesn't care about this you know like uh but this is supposedly the seven lo- levels of hell, you know, like that he's descending to hell, he, you know, like he starts off in heaven with a statue of Jesus. And by the end, he ends up in hell and he has like one last chance with that little young, the young, younger girl who he calls angel, uh, his calls an angel several times, uh, ask him to come back, but he chooses hell, you know, like you know, so what do you guys think about that? And there's like seven days, or it's the eighth day that he chooses hell. I think that, and you were also saying, Justin, that it feels like it's a lot longer. I also feel like it's a lot longer uh, time span, but maybe we're just shown like seven days within like a five year period or a year yeah, period. Yeah, I look at it more as the episodes are um, just representing aspects of his life, so you get the full picture. Yes. You know, and they don't That's, necessarily yeah. happen all in the same day, just like real life. Like some days you're going to think about your dad, you know, yeah. um, some yeah. days you're not. So um, I guess I kind of can't really talk about the end unless I kind of reference that we talked about this in, in a film studies class in college. Mm-hmm. And we talked about the end specifically. And I don't think it's so much that he chooses uh, hell, as you put it. But I, I think what is clear is that the opulence and the shallowness of the existence and the life that he is pursuing actively all the time is getting a little gross. Sure. You know, if, <laughs> if it wasn't already, it's getting a little uh, yeah. unpleasant and, and not like in that Fellini opulence kind of fun way where everyone's dancing around in the background and there's pretty girls and 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 whatever it's getting mean you know yeah. it's getting ugly he mm-hmm. resents being there you know, right he and, and resents I, everybody around him right and i don't think it's so much that he he sees her and it's like she's like come back and he's like nah i'm too far gone i look at it is because he can't hear her and this is kind of what we talked about in that class is like he he simply cannot hear her he doesn't he doesn't know the way back. He doesn't know how. He's lost the sure. He's lost the plot. He's lost the thread. Mm-hmm. He he's that lost to this yeah. life now. He it's not that he chooses it. It's that he's simply incapable of getting back. And so thematically, like, how do you think that ties in with the way that that mirrors the opening when he's in the helicopter and he's trying to get the the phone number of like the women by the pool, mm-hmm. um, and they can't hear him. Yeah. 
It's interesting. I, it's a, it's I a mirror. Like, yeah, yeah you're definitely. Right. It's a bookend for sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's trying to get their number and he's like, he's a good looking guy. You would think that these women would be successful. interested. Yeah. 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 And, but they're like, oh no, we're not going to give you our number. It's right. almost like, well, they're not living in the same world, so they can't hear each other then. They can't hear him anyways. Yeah. Well, and and so maybe it's the same way at the end, you know? Yeah. Well, and the mirror is that, you know, he's pursuing them at the beginning because he's always looking for something, right? And I don't think that any of his relationships have any super great meaning. And every time I think there's a chance for, like, a genuine happiness, I don't I don't know if he takes it. Uh, you know what I mean? I, I think he makes the wrong choice. So maybe the girl at the end represents a sort of purity of of a life that is calling him. Like, you could have this. <laughs> I think I might be reading yeah. a bit much into her, but I think she represents a simplicity, a simple life, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. you could uh, probably like to say, oh, good. And so well, basically that life is calling him. Now's the time. If you're ever going to do it, this is it. Do you think, do you think it's, it's actually an option? Cause I, I read the ending as, uh, it represents what's long been lost and there's no way about, there's no way. Even if you wanted to at that moment. It was like, an option you somewhere can't. in the film. Yeah, maybe somewhere in the film. But at that point, he's looking at something he can no longer attain, you know. And may- maybe I'm reading too much into his little, like, shrug gesture that's, you know, a, a pretty famous shot, too. Yeah. We can't hear her. But I-, I do think one of the things I kind of was reading was, like, it- she was saying, like, it's not too late or-, or something along those lines. You can come with me type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, according to her, it's not. I, like, yeah, I mean, it's like not literally like that's going to be his new wife. But I think she, sure, sure, she like symbolically yeah. represents like an, a road that he can't take anymore because he's not and capable. I, yeah, and I think you can also like, I mean, Fellini and his women, you know, like, and I'm not like, but like, he definitely has archetypes of women: the wife, the you know, like the mother, the whore, the mistress, you know, like yeah the mistress all those different things are, are there and then this is like the innocent the the madonna younger you know like the the person that represents um you know like a, the a better way of life type of thing yeah. um and, and, you know and i'm not like i don't want to put women in a pigeonhole or anything like that but i think that that's how fellini is telling this sure story. i mean yeah fellini's mm-hmm. fellini's telling this story and and i think if you've seen eight and a half Sure. You can certainly <laughs> unpack some complicated feelings about how sometimes women can be motherly, sometimes they can be sexy, sometimes they can be both at once <laughs> in his movies sometimes. <laughs> sure, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, either way, Justin, I think either interpretation is is true. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, I mean, I kind of view it as like uh spoilers for uh the vague arcs uh to most characters in one of my favorite movies ever boogie nights it's it's sort of like you can have these characters that get mixed up in this crazy world that maybe isn't the most fulfilling but they're so burrowed into it that even when they have their ups and downs they're still lost like even if they're mm-hmm. having an up day you know what I mean? Like they're still like on a path that they they've never really been able to get out of, and I think that's that's him, right? You know, like Boogie Nights ends yeah. with like God only knows what I'd be without you, and then you have all these characters still swarming around Burt Reynolds, who kind of sucks, and, and you know, and they're like, it's kind of a sad ending, right? I think this is sort of him, but with his own impulses, the life, the sweet life, the the being a, a celebrity journalist and fraternizing and all that stuff i think he's just he sunk too much time into it now and this is just who he is yeah what well even when we start the movie he doesn't seem that interested in the journalism aspect we want it's he's choosing it's, between journalism and literary uh writing right at kind of yeah. throughout the movie yeah um and even even that so he doesn't he he doesn't fit with the paparazzo uh, and he, but he also doesn't fit with like the hot, the who the paparazzo is uh, uh, filming or taking shots of. He is literally in purgatory. He's between those two things, right? Um, mm-hmm. So that I think that that 
fits. He's too cool for both of them, you know, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I found it interesting, you know, to, to go with like the boogie nights thing, you know, that's about a bunch of characters who are, or at least like our main characters are porn stars. <laughs> yeah. You know, actually like the, the stars. Right. Um, I think this movie is like interesting thinking about how he's not a famous person, but he, wants to enjoy their world <laughs> right and like wants sure. to get into yeah. it from like like tangentially being there but without yeah he, he likes know, the without opulence. the downside yeah <laughs> yeah um and it just kind of colors a, a lot of the things he does for me of seeing him try to be involved <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and kind of seek that out so i have a question for you uh if this was made today would it be a TV show or would it be better as a TV show or is it better as a movie? Because, and I think, like, I kind of felt the length watching this because, you know, after each little section, and I think this is why it's so hard to get through the first hour, like what we were talking about, like when we first st- started trying to watch it, you know, like it ends, you know, like there's an ending and then it starts something new and you kind of don't have your bearing on that new thing. So you just kind of turn it off. It doesn't, there's no hook. Uh, mm-hmm. Would this be a better TV show? Uh, as opposed to a movie, uh, or is it fine the way it is? Does that make sense? Uh, you could like a Mad Men, you know, like you could have eight episodes or so type of thing. Hmm. I think if you're prepared for something episodic like this, um, it can be more doable. And I don't, I don't know that I ever was. Like, I, but that's maybe on me because I just tend to not research things I'm interested in. I'm like, well, I just want to watch it and figure yeah, out what yeah. the heck's going on. Um, it's not till the second time you're like, oh, okay, I know what this is. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I, I mean, I hesitate because like, if, if it was a TV show, then it would suddenly be six hours long. Right, <laughs> that's true. Or eight hours long. And um, as it is, I think it's a good length. But it is, it is difficult to s- go through those... Um, those like rise and falls of story and plot um yeah. multiple times uh, and I guess, I guess we're just so accustomed to when we feel that climax or like the the falling action of a plot that we know what's about to wrap up yeah. <laughs> maybe like internally we we start to move on mentally yeah. and emotionally yeah. but what do you think mike uh you know I think there's a version of this that could work as a TV show or something episodic where you could stream it all at once or something. That said, I don't know that the idea is best portrayed spread out like that. Yeah. Unless it's got other ideas as well. This seems very much like a character study to me. And with that in mind, you know, I kind of prefer to get it all out in one one long thing right before elements of the first episode start to wane in my memory you know um makes sense yeah so I, i'm gonna say probably best to keep it in a movie form you know there are some sh- like uh shows that have been made out of movies uh that are like the exact same thing like for example uh black narcissus was made into oh, yeah. <laughs> a tv show on fx or something fx yeah uh, I never watched it, but uh, I can't imagine it was better. <laughs> I did watch the first episode, I think. How was it? But I I don't really remember, so mm. that speaks to it in itself, right? It must be <laughs> must be awesome. Yeah. I mean, the thing about Black Narcissus, the reason I go back to it is the way it looked. You know, like uh, the movie, at least. You know, uh, the story is great, but it, there's something about the way it looks that the Michael. And I think the same thing could be yeah, said about archers. Dolce Vita. Yeah. Um, is there is a certain way about the way this movie looks, the way it's made, that if that gets lost in translation. You know, you, it'd be hard to. I, I don't know how hard this movie was to make or how long it took to film, but I can imagine only getting one shot in a day in some of these. You know. Well, uh, you have to also have to keep sequences. in mind that because this is an Italian film and this was the standard of the industry. Um. And I'm sure you noticed while watching it, but they don't film with sound on the day. Yeah, sure. Right? So uh, orchestrating that many people and getting shots is a lot easier when 
you don't have to. There's no sound. Yeah, you don't have to make everyone stop moving (laughs) and shut up. (laughs) Yeah, you could stand off and yell or, you know, I think it's pretty well documented that Fellini would play music, you know, Mm -hmm. to give the scene a tempo. That's true. That makes sense. That actually, that's really cool. I hadn't thought about that. I I do like the music in this. I, he the what well, what is his name? Nino the musician. Rota? Yeah, he did like um the Godfather too. But there's something special about his music where the music is almost a character even in, in the Godfather, you know, like there it stands apart from the rest of the movie as opposed to uh what would you like being in the background this the music stands in the foreground if that makes sense it, like the godfather you know like mm-hmm. like um yeah. and i really enjoy that uh it's, it's a character it's, in itself well it's so intermittent intermittent there you go <laughs> that thank you it, <laughs> that when it shows up it's like oh yeah wow okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> there it is that's a piece of music all right there's that score <laughs> you know yeah. um it's not so ongoing um it's a bit like uh, what was that like All Quiet on the Western Front? Oh um, yeah, the, the watch that like didn't have much score, but when it was there, it was like hello. You could tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I like it too. There's like a, I don't, I, I would have to like listen to it closer, but I had trouble telling if um, it was the the recording quality of the score or the score itself that has. At least as the movie goes on, I think a uh, an uncomfortable dissonance and like noisy quality to it where it didn't quite sound like cleanly recorded or maybe everything wasn't quite in tune, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. but was close. Yeah. Um, but it was something that, I don't know, put me on edge in terms of music, like it sort of gave me, lended to like some anxiety <laughs> that I felt. Um, just because, or like unease, I guess is maybe a better term with the score. I don't know that if you guys felt that. Yeah. 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 So, uh, something I think we probably need to touch on, or at least I need to touch on, because it was alluded to earlier. So there's a. Do you remember uh, the scene when they're all dancing, or? We, one of the scenes when they're all dancing, but <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the character, I, th- I think his name was Frankie. <laughs> oh yeah. But wouldn't they're with Anita Eckberg the actor, in like, the yeah. club. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an awesome club, by the way, just, just this outdoor club with all these like little tables with their own little tents. I agree. That, that seems pretty cool. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was awesome, but you know, what's not awesome. <laughs> Frankie and yeah. his, his disturbing beard. And his dance, uh, where he like makes kissy faces at uh, Anita and like, Ekberg, and he's oh, just like, bitey little snap, yeah, snap center. Yeah. But his beard, he makes him look like a goat, like mm-hmm. some kind of weird like Greek looking like half goat man thing or something. Because his beard is just yeah. absolutely horrible. You know, it looked yeah. like both his hair and his beard look like porcelain put I on know, his that's head. What I'm saying, it looks like a weird Greek. <laughs> Like statue, I don't know. It's gross looking though, with the black and white, yeah. and mm-hmm. certainly weird. That guy's like weird kissy faces uh, and in like flirty snaps. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it took me a long time to forget them, and then when he popped up again, I, it all came back to me. <laughs> <laughs> the horror. <Yeah. laughs> that so that sequence of those sequences of shots with the, him and uh, Anita Ekberg dancing. Was the DVD menu on that Netflix DVD that I had for I like think that's three why. months? I think that's why, like, it sticks in my brain, just because I kind of remember that menu. Yeah, it would just <laughs> stick on the on the TV, you know, when you're getting ready to play it, or you know, after it's over. And I don't know, we talked about how much we didn't get, understand the movie or whatever <laughs> right. happened. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was so that helped burn that image into my brain. Yeah, um, how upsetting. I think there was, yeah, there's like a recent Twitter. Uh, I don't know game trend whatever um, where it was like post a character that like wasn't necessarily scary but scared you as a kid <laughs> and this was a solid candidate even though I think I was like 20 or 21 when <laughs> I saw this movie you. It, it still gave you still, nightmares it scared you as if you were a child <laughs> yeah, it made, yeah it made me feel 
feel like a child again checking under my bed for <laughs> goat beard man <laughs> yeah scary men who are gonna make kissy yeah. faces at you and <laughs> dance in front of you anyways uh so yeah i hate that guy <laughs> <laughs> well we've watched the movie now so hopefully you never have to yeah we can skip um, that part next time endure it again yeah <laughs> Um, Although it's also one of the best parts in the film, like uh, he's because I love that sequence with her, just the whole thing, and then with the kitten on their head, and uh, that that whole sequence is pretty great. Okay, so yeah, like uh, good good segue, Chris, to something that made me think <laughs> of something. So, what is our favorite segment of this movie? Like, what what is like your absolute favorite sequence? Ooh, uh, uh, go ahead, Chris. <sighs> It's hard to pick. I think that that might be the sequence that, like, where I still feel a little bit of joy. <laughs> you know, like, I think as we get further in, the sequences are still good, but they have, like, a tinge of, like, melancholy to them. Like, I, I would say, like, the, the castle sequence is pretty amazing. But, you know, like, they're confessing love to each other. And, you know, immediately while confessing love, she starts making out with somebody else. And then he goes off and, and hits on other women. So you're like, I don't know about this. Yeah. You know? I don't like, think these people are in touch with their emotions Yeah, they don't mean well. what they yeah. say. Uh, <laughs> but in that sequence, even though, he you know, he's got a girlfriend and all that stuff, there there's something about that actress that there's kind of a joy to what she's doing um, and an innocence to what she's doing that doesn't feel um, as melancholy as the rest. I, I Although I think this time the, the father sequence really, um, really spoke out, spoke to me quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, Justin, yeah. how about you? Yeah. Well, I, I want to touch on Anita Ekberg. Like, you know, for a long time, I kind of viewed her as the, you know, the Marilyn Monroe and I, I didn't catch it till this time, but, she says something about somebody like exercising or like, she's like, that's a great way to lose weight. I better tell, tell Marilyn she says. <laughs> um, and I didn't catch that before. Hmm. So I thought that was fun. And I assume that was referencing Marilyn Monroe. Probably. Um, but anyways, I thought my, she was like Bridget Bardot or something. I guess so. But yeah, anyways, uh, but I guess it was just the way she talks. Um, just very much sounds like Marilyn Monroe to me, you know, but mm-hmm. I guess like her status as an actress within like the world of the movie is supposed to be probably a B list Marilyn Monroe, like someone who isn't quite that level so that they could feasibly afford to bring her over to Italy and put her in a movie and have an American star, you know, kind of like they, they did with like Clint Eastwood and Lee Van Cleef and stuff. Yeah. Right? It was a big thing in the Italian movie industry at yeah. that time. So yeah, Rick Dalton, I think too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rick Dalton, which uh, rest in you peace. know, yeah, yeah rest in yeah. peace, man. Sad. I wonder if uh, he'll be in the Oscar. Yeah, I mean, memoriam. in memoriam, if they'll remember. Not him. a guy I would have pegged to live to ninety, though. You know. <laughs> yeah, he lived yeah. pretty hard. Not at all. Not at all. Um, what were we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, she was a star, like uh, a lower tier star. Uh, yeah, Swedish oh, right. star. Yes. From yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Anyways, uh, yeah, I think uh, my favorite, uh, my favorite sequence or episode, I guess. Um, I do really like the scene that you said, Chris, where they're in the they're in the room and they're whispering and talking to each other. Um, and maybe it's because it's kind of I, I know that that's a real thing that like architecturally you can design things to work that way, mm-hmm. but it's maybe the most sort of like magical surreal thing in this movie. And that's one of my favorite things um, about Fellini and his work um, is when he dips into that. So like that part gives me this, this hint of my favorite thing about Fellini. (laughs) So um, it's just kind of one of those that it's so cinematically interesting and inventive that, uh, I I perk up I guess when this happens, so it's probably that. How about you, Mike? So they're not long sequences, but they're the ones that I always think of when I think of this movie. And it's not the fountain sequence, although this time I I really liked the entire uh, father sequence, like the entire episode. I thought it was just like that yeah. that mm-hmm. episode was actually like really great. 
But the ones I always think of are the beginning and end with uh, the Jesus yeah. statue flying in and uh, yeah. the the sea creature on the beach. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the, Is that a devil ray? Is that, like, tie into the hell thing? It could, yeah. I mean, sense. it's like a stingray, but like sometimes they're called devil rays. I just thought it was sort of like a, like a not real creature. I didn't know it was actually like a real animal. Uh, it looked like a stingray. It, it just looked like a stingray. Yeah, a giant stingray. I didn't that. know the stingrays got that big, so I thought it was just like a fake animal that they made up to look like a stingray, like a big stingray. But I don't know. What gotcha. do I know? Nothing. I'm no zoologist. Yeah. But you may be right, Justin. Got a, yeah. yeah should have got a zoologist for this episode <laughs> as a guest. <laughs> Anyways, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, no, but I mean, that's it, right? Like the, the beginning and end. I think that whole like beach sequence after the the ugly, gross party and mm-hmm. um, the, you know, the girl trying to reach out to him that he can't hear. I don't know. That just never, never, like never isn't the first thing I think of when I th- start thinking of this movie. Yeah. I, my mind goes to the fountain scene, but I, I think it's just because that fountain is so iconic and so is that scene. And I've seen it in other things. and Sure. Um, I think they like recreated in that movie nine, the, yeah. the musical. I, I think the thing, the image that sticks out to me the most, every time I think about this movie is him just writing the girl. And I think because, I mean, he, he's been a, a cad this whole movie, but at that point you're like, Oh fuck this guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like he's being a now jerk. you're just behaving badly to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, so you're on his side until that moment. And you're like, Oh boy, like, uh, I, I liked you, but I was hoping I was rooting for you, but not anymore. You know, <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. It's pretty hard to root for him after his, uh, the woman that lives with him tries to kill herself and, Oh, yeah, at the very beginning. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. really change yeah. his ways. Which, by the way, weird hospital. Am I right? Yeah. All those, yeah, yeah, with the I the hats. Did, did, well, like, you just drive yeah. into it. You're just... Yeah. <laughs> and then you wait into the area that you drove into and parked in. Yeah, like, what is this? I don't know. That's also the waiting room slash parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. I don't understand yeah. it. I don't yeah. even know if that... I, is that how hospitals were in Italy in the 60s? Or, like, is this just some place that he was like, this is a hospital? People and nurses <laughs> this outfits is the closest place. Yeah. It's a hospital for the famous. <laughs> yeah, I guess. That's, yeah. Why, that's why you don't know what it is because yeah. you, you know, you've never you seen have, it. Yeah. I'm not if you have to ask, you can't, yeah. af- you can't afford that's it. That's the reason I started this podcast, was getting into one of those hospitals, but uh, it hasn't worked out so far. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're not making, we're just barely not making enough for you to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right, I got like two things I think that uh, left for me. So one of the things I really liked in this movie that kind of goes a little overboard later on in Fellini is the costumes. The costumes are great. And I think there's two things that like help it, it, like it's in black and white. Like later on, I think Fellini goes a little crazy with costumes. (laughs) Uh, But there's two things like it's in black and white so they're a little toned down you know like when they get like crazy costumes especially like towards the end of the movie uh but i i love the way that they're dressed in, in this film it, you know it's because and it, it walks that line between being too much and not enough you know like it it's just these kind of like uh i guess what would the word be uh extravagant or you know like uh opulent i guess was the two good words for those things um as opposed to you know like his tuxedo or whatever um whereas like late in his later films they it becomes you know it's way too much uh, and they become distracting from the film but in here it's it's pretty great uh i i really like it so what do you guys think about the costuming yeah i mean looks great i i wouldn't ever say an unkind word about Fellini's over the topness in his other films, <laughs> later his films, later but... films get like. Have you seen sure. City of Women? City of Women is like. No, I, I like it. It's. A, I yeah. mean, all of Fellini's films are good, uh, but they get a bit much. Is what I yeah, would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's coming from someone who hasn't seen all of them, but I've seen a lot of them. Yeah. But anyways, no, I I I think it's all great here. Uh, I I think, you know, Anita Ekberg's is iconic. You sure. know, yeah, that's like. A costume I could, if I could draw, I w- would be able to draw it from memory. Yeah, but I true. can't. I think that's the costume that maybe someone who hasn't even seen the movie could like look at and be like, ah, yes, 
<laughs> the La Dolce yeah, you Vita know the fountain dress. sequence yeah. for sure yeah yeah I, I was yeah what do you think Mike is, or do you think anything about that no I mean I think they're pretty great like uh, you know a lot of great dresses you know his suits all look snappy good that's yeah, yeah. He looks good in a tuxedo, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. I like the the girl who comes in in the first club, and actually, I like those performers that pop up in the first club, like the the when like the mask and all the like the dangly stuff. That's like the first shot of the, when we go into that club from the opening, like Jesus statue sequence. Yeah, oh, and he's yeah. like singing. I don't know that that's cool, but the after their performance is done and the music kicks off, there's like a girl that walks in in like a like a flat hat and like. Uh, those like gloves that go up past her elbows and she like starts dancing and moving her arms and that's who we follow into the club and like follow anyways her costume is cool if you remember it (laughs) (laughs) but it sounds like you don't but I don't know I kind of do yeah she gives like a like a Audrey Hepburn vibe yeah yeah um one other thing that I had was there's a few moments in the film where we transition time. Like, time seems to pass very quickly. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the, the main one, and I think maybe the most obvious one, um, is the when he climbs into the fountain with Anita Ekberg. Mm-hmm. Um, he's oh, in there and he's talking day. to her and then it and she's like listen and then all of a sudden like like the water stops and then it cuts to like a wide shot and the water's all gone and it's daytime suddenly yeah instead of the middle of the night um bit of like surreal um Fellini there um there's a little bit of it's not super surreal but truth to that moment too though like I don't know uh this probably isn't like super flattering of myself but there are nights there have been nights where like I drink a lot uh, and had a big party <laughs> and there's people over, you know, and stuff like that. And it's like the dead of night until it's not, <laughs> you know, and you're like, what the fuck? How did the sun already come up? You know, right? yeah. um, so that's, yeah. <laughs> that's probably a more optimistic, like reading of how, of why that moment is there are. That's probably a more accurate reading. I should say my more optimistic take is that he was enjoying his time and didn't notice that the time was flying by because he was with a <laughs> he was you know, enchanted. a super attractive yeah. woman. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah enchanted. Um, when was there was another time yeah. that that happened too? At the end, wasn't it? Like they were uh, having the big party, and then all of a sudden the sun was up. Yeah, that yeah, it kind of happens there. I think it kind of happens with the father. Like it's pretty nighttime when they're in the apartment, the woman's apartment, and he's talking to him, um, and then he leaves, and we cut to outside and it's pretty daytime of him and I, maybe yeah. some of that's like well they happened to shoot it while it was a little bit more daytime but it seemed to like more time seems to have passed than like should have technically of him just like leaving that building and going to get in a cab yeah yeah and uh I, there's kind of the one where he like he has the argument with the with the his girlfriend if he has a girlfriend or whatever the kind of dramatic woman oh yeah, yeah um and like he like leaves her after their fight in the middle of the night and then like we cut and it's daytime and she's still out there man yeah how long <laughs> but, do you think she was out there for <laughs> yeah i mean it's kind of like that that one's just kind of a passage of time trick it's not quite yeah. that sort of like bending All time in a way time, that doesn't yeah. make sense um but i thought this, that scene looks really cool with like that giant light fixture yeah where were they <laughs> yeah who knows oh uh one of the episodes we have just haven't really touched on much is like the the children who see the madonna yeah yeah um which is which is really interesting and i just enjoy the climax of that sequence um of everyone tearing apart the tree yeah. <laughs> the miracle tree yeah wanting, <laughs> wanting their own piece of it yeah um like pretty pretty cool fervorously destroying the thing that you think is a miracle yeah, yeah. is holy yeah. um if you like that sequence you should watch the leftovers but um yeah that sequence is really great uh that, that's one of the ones like i think that might be the most chaotic and the most things going on um mm-hmm. in one like set piece or one thing it, it was beautiful it was amazing to watch yeah that one yeah. feels like a little mini eight and a half within this movie 
<laughs> sure. Yeah. If for no other reason than all like the production equipment and shit. Right. Yeah. Just, it just gives feels it the same like vibe. eight and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody keeps coming out there. They're filming it. I thought that there was a movie that they were filming at some point. You know, like because they have a big crane with a camera on it. You know, mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. pretty crazy. Um. Yeah, I, I like that sequence a lot, the children and all that. But I, I think that there's one main through line that we haven't touched on at all, and this is my last thing, but that is the uh, gentleman with the children that commits suicide and kills his children. Um, I, I do think oh, we yeah. need to talk about that because that pops up like two or three times throughout the film. So it's it's kind of, or that guy does, it's kind of like the main through line, uh, I think, of the movie, or, or it's a big chunk of it. So... Um, Man, that is depressing. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you make of it? Uh, I, well, one of the things I was kind of thinking about. Well, he was a guide. You know, like he wanted him to choose between journalism uh, and literature, right? Mm-hmm. As what he was going to write, like the lower road or the higher road, as seen by Fellini. You know, journalism being the lower road. And when he commits suicide and kills his children, uh. Marcello no longer cares, you know, like he, his guide is, you know, did something horrible, you know. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that pushed him over the edge, I think. What do you guys think? Justin? Mike? Oh, sure. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, some of the, the guy kind of represented, you know, a life that maybe he should aspire to. At least in that guy's opinion. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think it, it uh, you know, clearly sort of serves as a, as something to um, make him, make um, Marcello like question things even more and be totally unsure of like what he's doing with his life. Right. Of like, mm-hmm. oh man, this one thing, you know, people, this is the thing that people want, you know, like a nice house. Um, friends to come over for a, a party or whatever and and two beautiful children that you can tuck in and kiss at night and um three what didn't he kill three wasn't three? it three children so three i only remember the I two because they the yeah, i'm remembering sure the two because they come out in the middle of the party and everyone's like what are you two doing up yeah it, it, it may be just two but i thought he maybe it was three people died including it, him yeah it's two children and himself yeah. yeah um but like when you think this person has it all and then they do something like that just sort of like uh, uproots your foundation maybe right like it skews his whole perspective on what he should aspire to or what yeah. you know uh what the real sweet life might be mhm and it's riding women at parties and throwing feathers on them yeah making them into chickens <laughs> mhm that's the sweet life. This is what we all took away, right? Yep. <laughs> That's sure. the lesson I learned. Yeah. I, I, now Good. I carry a bag of feathers with me wherever I go. It's just a pillow. Just go with a pillow. Yeah, a pillow. This is, then it's it's a little more useful. <laughs> you can use it as, for a nap. Until um, you need it. Yeah. Until one day you meet the right woman or man or, you know. Yeah, whatever. Non-binary Chicken. person. <laughs> meet, meet the right person and... It, you know what to do with those feathers. <laughs> we, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have anything else with uh, for La Dolce Vita? Uh, I don't think so. I, don't I think love so. this movie, I don't. though. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that this may be one of my favorite uh, Fellini films, if not better than Eight and a Half. Yeah. It's certainly tied. Eight and a Half is more like nostalgia because I, there's like the... F- that eight and a Half is kind of like the one that got me into film. Yeah. You know, like I was like my first Criterion to buy type sure. of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but this one I think may be better, even though it's it's taken me some time to appreciate it more. I more. like it better than Eight and a Half, but just barely. Uh, and it's my number two Fellini film. The first one for me is still Knights of Kiberia. Hmm? Yeah. yeah, it's a good one. I I think Eight and a Half is still my favorite. My second is probably Knights of Kiberia. Um, this one might be my third, although it's pretty close. I've always really been fond of Juliet of the Spirits. Juliet of the Spirits is a good one. I like Lestrada quite a bit. Oh. Uh, yeah, Armacord is, 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 is really good, and Armacord is another one. Maybe it's just a Fellini thing, but Armacord is another one where it took me a couple of times to yeah. like really get to know the characters and spend time with them. So, anyways, I think I yeah. watched Armacord after 
eight and a half in La Dolce Vita, so I was, I was ready. Prepared. I was ready for it. <laughs> You're ready. Well, I think not to get into an armor court review, but uh, a lot of his movies have this quality of like characters that um, I want to go back and revisit. Mm-hmm. You know, with the exception of like creepy goat bearded people <laughs> there's a lot of characters i always want to revisit you know and um i think la dolce vita kind of fits in that category too you get to you know, know him better too each time you watch the movie mm-hmm. I, I think that that's the quality of the a fellini film especially armacord and that but this yeah. movie as well la dolce vita uh, the, the, you see this again you're like oh i i see something new in the father i see something new in um uh, Stinton was that his name the guy that uh, murdered his children you know you see something new yeah. in each of these characters and you get to know them better you know like uh, I think it is kind yeah. of what makes it worthwhile yeah uh, I agree and you know I've often cited Fellini as my favorite director which by the way is a hit at parties and meeting people yeah, I'm sure um, they just love it yeah. when you talk <laughs> about film and that you're into Fellini um, who <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but I've always said, often cited him as like my favorite director, and um, but I always felt weird about that because I didn't love La Dolce Vita and felt like it was, you know, at a distance from me. Mm-hmm. Um, so rewatching it this time has been great, and it's kind of made me feel even better about claiming him as my favorite director. Yeah. About boring all those people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. really funny. I like. I, there was a game this happened i was, I was at a, a party and um this guy was like oh you should meet this guy he's really into movies and i was like great so we started talking we were talking about movies really exciting and the, c- the conversation just died and like <laughs> any like chemistry or like re- friendship we were gonna build just died when he brought up fellini when i said fellini was my favorite director of all time was it because <laughs> he didn't know who fellini was or because i don't know i don't know yeah. <laughs> he hated fellini uh, yeah i'll say that this person's answer was spielberg for their favorite director of all oh, time well, that makes which sense. is not but spielberg's great yes he it's is not really a slight great. it's not a slight at all it's a great answer pretty mainstream perfectly, though perfectly valid yeah yeah it's just so that's really like my only bearing for <laughs> why the conversation might have died sure anyways that's my story of bringing up <laughs> Fellini at a party <laughs> okay and I think we're done right yeah I think so yes. I think we did it we've cool. done it yeah we just have to do the uh, the poll now so our, our choices for the next Criterion poll yeah you guys ready yeah I yes. am alright um, I guess I'll just introduce it this poll uh, the theme um, I don't know the episode will come out within june but we're choosing this poll during june um, so we're going with uh pride month as a theme so these are lgbtq plus uh criterion films and i'm not sure if all the films on the criterion list that i found are um story wise like lgbtq plus um or if, like also the director sometimes sure. belongs in that category um i think it's a mixture so so chris what's your choice Oh boy. Um, well, there's a lot of pressure since I've won so many in the last few times. Yeah. Uh, and what's your runtime? You have to say that before we yeah, approve the. Yeah, uh, the runtime is six hours. Um, mm-hmm. No, it's 107 minutes. Uh, and it's. I Beautiful. wanted to go with another one uh, of. Uh, what is it? How do you pronounce his name? Mastrani. Marcel Mastrani. Uh, Mastriani? Mastriani, yes. Yeah, so thank you. Mm-hmm. But um, a special day. Um, which he's a little bit older, directed by Ettor Scola. I have not seen this, uh, but I, I do want to further branch out with, uh, especially that actor. So um, that is my pick. I don't think I'm going to win if I'm putting all oh. my chips on the table. Have you so. seen the, uh, isn't he in some Antonioni films, Mike? Uh, yeah. Mastriani? Yes. Yeah. Have you seen those, Chris? Yeah, some of those. Yeah. Lido- okay. uh, wait, not Lidolo Trivita. What is the one where he's like searching for somebody? Ventura. Love and Terror. Is Love he and that? Terror. Yeah, yeah. I think so. so. Okay. Cool. Anyways, I know he's in, was it La Note? Yeah, La Note. Yeah, I think okay. I've seen those Antonioni films. Uh, okay. But... La Note is great. As yeah. is Love I was going to recommend. Yeah. Anywho, anywho, okay. Special day. Uh, Mike. <laughs> okay, so right here, I'm going to have to throw out a film that I have never seen. But I'm a fan of this director's work, and that is Mishima, A Life in Four Chapters, uh, directed oh, nice. by Paul Schrader. I don't know how this fits into this, because I've never seen it, but it's on this list that I'm looking at. Yeah. So, 
I think Paul Schrader is he? Does he uh, fit into the LGBT? Like as a person? No, no, I, I, I don't, don't believe so. so. Oh, okay. I think it might just be something in the subject matter of the movie. Okay. Cool. Good to know. I'll be embarrassed um, if this wins, and then we watch it, and there's absolutely nothing to do with LGBTQ. <laughs> yeah, then we'll have to start researching yeah, to figure out why. <laughs> I have to prepare for an episode. What the heck? Oh, no. Uh, Justin, what are you going to choose? All right. So I'm going to choose um, a film I've, I've wanted to see for a long time. Um, and it's by a director that I've liked some of his films a lot. And other films um, haven't quite done it for me. Um, but this is a Wong Kar Wai film called uh, yes. Happy, Happy Together. I've never seen this, but um, I've wanted to for a long, 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 long time. Yeah. Yeah, this is really good. I've seen it. Yeah, this is one of the Wong Kar Wai's I never got into whenever I went through my phase a few years back. So, yeah. Cool. So, um, to recap, Mike chose Mishima, Life in Four Chapters. Chris chose A Special Day, and I chose Happy Together. So, those are your choices. Uh, The link to the Twitter poll will be in the show notes. And um, I don't know. I assume this will be out. The poll will be live whenever you're listening to this, so yeah, go there. Hopefully, vote. Yeah. All right, cool. So, anything yeah. else? No, I would say that does it for this episode, right? I think so. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you, listeners, so much for listening. Of course, as always, thanks Jake Wagner Russell for doing our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of it, go to SoundCloud.com/slash Bobscotch. All right, stay tuned to this channel. Subscribe, like all that stuff. Uh, our next episode will be what is our next episode going to be the flash comes out this weekend do we want to talk about that i mean mildly yeah mildly. I mean, i'm gonna see it either way so yeah probably the flash Who knows? we'll see yeah i was having an internal <laughs> debate because for outside of the film reasons of going to see this or not but if we yeah. uh, if we all agree uh, yeah, we'll have to we'll, maybe talk about this further. So. Is Past Lives, <laughs> that's opened near me. June, is it open near you? I know June 23rd is when it goes wide. So oh, we okay. can look and see. But June past 16th, lives, it's, it's near me. Oh, if it's near us, we should go see it, uh, Mike, since we kind of live in the same area. Mm. Uh, mm. We'll look into it. So Past Lives, maybe how to yeah. blow up a pipeline? <laughs> Could try oh, to bring that movie up. M- maybe The I'm Flash. Uh, who yeah. knows? I guess the Flash but, or Past Lives, but it'll be one of those two. Yeah, cool. Uh, in, either way, thanks so much for listening, and we will see you guys next time. Bye. Bye bye.